Hey everyone, welcome to r slash Tales from Tech Support, where we get to have a little chuckle at the technologically disadvantaged, like me. I'm Uncle Reddit, and have I got a story for you. In case you couldn't tell with a little bit of noise in the background, our shop is actually functional today. I got some help in here making up for my, uh, my lack of enthusiasm the last couple weeks, so I'm going to let her keep working while I record. Now on to the stories. User needs a new email address. I had a comment on our Outlook page saying I couldn't find out how to get a new email address. I ended up reaching out to the user and their reply was, I need new generic dot shared at company email address, but also need a personal one. As the form is a bit fiddly for exact email requests, got a ton of shared mailboxes at our office.office .office team rather than office.team, I ended up submitting it for them to approve. Then got on to the second part of the user needing a personal one. Bearing in mind, I was contacting them on name at company. After some questions, user just said they need to keep the one they have. Realized they took the you only can have one email address a bit too literally. User called me a savior for getting them sorted and we add one more shared mailbox to the list we need to license. Oh, well that was nice and easy. At least they weren't being rude about it. Don't use me to lie for you got a call this morning regarding Outlook. The first phone call was basic and easy to fix. Nothing major or exciting. User states her email shows the paperclip of an attachment, but when she clicked the email, no attachment. I get connected and see the delta indicating her email is sorted into conversations. I expand it and show her it was an email in the conversation chain that had the attachment. She asked me to undo show as conversations. An hour later, Buddy on Teams asked me to take a call as this lady's manager was mad at me for undoing her show as conversations. Me. Hi, this is me with IT. What seems to be the trouble? Manager. Yes, one of your employees undid the security settings on user's outlook. Me. Visible confusion. Um, which security setting? Manager. Sorting emails by conversation or show as conversation has been a security mandate in our company since 2016. IT has mandated this since before I started here. Can you confirm this for me? It's at this moment I realize he was not talking to me, but talking down to user loudly so I could hear it. Me. I'm sorry, were you talking to me or user? User. He was talking to me. Manager. Well, both of you. I need you to confirm that this is a security measure. Team's message comes in from him. Just agree to it. <laughs> well, my sound was muted, so no ding came over the phone. I didn't actually click on the message, so the eyeball didn't appear on his side in Teams. Me. No, it's not. That's ridiculous. Password 2FA, security program, and AV firewall program are the only security measures for email. Well, only ones for client side. Server side has significantly more. Manager. So, it's not a security requirement? Me. Nope. In fact, we recommend against show as conversation as it leads to confusion. Teams pop up. Is this the same me I have on the phone? User. So we don't have to use it? Me. Well, IT doesn't mandate it for security purposes. I can't speak to your direct supervisor's policies. I waited an hour before replying on Teams on my phone. Apologies, I guess Teams crashed in Citrix before you called. I didn't see these pop-ups until I checked my cell phone just now. He didn't reply. I'm not sure why that boss was after the user, but there definitely seemed to be some sort of uh, personal vendetta going on. Or just a weird know-it-all who has too much power. Either way. Please don't literally punch in. Short background. I work for a non-IT office position in a retail chain where I'm relegated tech issues, which I either resolve on my own with basic troubleshooting, the definition varies, or enlist support from the help desk. This is a tale from my old store last year. Our time clock was scheduled for an upgrade in the coming months, and it was needed because one button had partially sunken into the casing and had been pressed just right to actuate, and this number happened to be part of everyone's ID. Because of the scheduled upgrade and the shortage of replacements at the time due to worldwide things, we had to make do with this until the new one arrived. I came into work one Sunday morning, an hour before everyone else, to help with the overnight transition, and went to punch in except the button was completely sunken in and wouldn't activate. Of course this happened on a Sunday, and of course, it also happens to be the end of a bi-weekly pay period. There's another way for associates to punch in and out, but it involves a computer. Gasp. 
and it would take the entire day to both train associates to do it and convince them that it's in their best interest instead of filling out a paper that I have to come back that night to key in manually. I've done that before after a system outage, also on a Sunday at the end of a bi-weekly pay period, haha. <laughs> and it takes about an hour to do 50. There was one hour before associates started arriving for work. 45 minutes for the early birds and I decided to fix it myself. It's already working 0% so I can't really make it any worse. Although in hindsight, maybe we could have escalated a ticket for replacement in this condition. I would just have to deal with one day's worth of papers. What can I say, I was young and reckless and panicked instead of considering all my options. I took the thing off the wall, unplug and lift up, and took it back to my office to open it up on the counter. Grab socket screw with fingers and pull. I can see where the real button and plastic are supposed to be, and where they actually are, and they're not the same. I also know that helpful mechanical engineers flowchart about what to do when things move when they aren't supposed to, and grabbed a roll of electrical tape from a nearby drawer. The circuit board was screwed down pretty intricately and I couldn't completely remove it. Best I could do was lift one side and try to get some rolled up electrical tape in position with a screwdriver and press it back down. While doing this, I'm also repeatedly stepping away to touch a large metal object just in case some staticky shenanigans happen. My office shocked me a lot. Enough that I developed a fear response and had to will myself through it in years prior. Thankfully, a new manager had recently transferred and whatever poltergeist I had on me jumped to him, and the shock stopped. He needs therapy, though. I don't know if static discharge would damage this time clock, but I didn't want to find out the hard way, so I kept touching large metal objects just in case. The surgery was a success, and the time clock went back up on the wall before anyone else had even arrived, with a note for associates to press the buttons gently. My workmanship must have been pretty good because it stayed functional until the new model came in a month later. Yeah, way to go taking the initiative on that one, OP. I mean, really, you were going to have to do something either way. And it sounded like it was a good bet to try to repair it before just going ahead and uh, sucking it up and taking on the paper roll that night. So you probably saved yourself some time, too. You work in IT, so you should have my info automatically. Customer called in the other day because he was having an issue with the keyboard not working on his PC. He had bought the computer from another retailer, so we would have to get the PC information so we could proceed with getting him a new keyboard. Business owner. I purchased your system and I need help. Me. No problem. May I have your order number, please? Business owner. The invoice number is number that is not ours. Me. Apologies, but that doesn't match any of our information. Business owner. This is the number that they gave me when I bought it, and I called them already and they told me to give this to you. Me. My apologies, but if that's not our invoice order information, I'll need the number off the system that is located on the back to register cut off by business owner. This is ridiculous. I run a business and can't be wasting my time. The system is behind several wires and I can't access it. It's not even the PC, it's the keyboard that comes with it. Old Omelet says you can use this order number to look me up and you're an information technology representative, so you should have access to the data. Me. Yes, while that may be true, that doesn't mean I have the ability to access customer information from a completely different company. As you said, you run a business and should know that another company shouldn't have access to another company's private customer records. Business owner hangs up. Entitlement and narcissism is alive and well, boys and girls. Thank God for DNS time expirations. So let me lay the groundwork here. At the time, I was working in operations but by and large, I did 99% of the DNS work for my organization. DNS failed, I was called. But you ask, weren't you in ops? Yes, yes I was. It didn't matter that I didn't own it. Thanks, network services. Somehow, I was the DNS guru. Anyway, fast forward, and somehow I was also responsible for Big IP and GSLB, also the guru. So between the two, I'm working for a very large healthcare and university center. On the order of, if I was in Taiwan, said the name in English, they would know. Stage is set. I'm working in DNS to implement our new GSLB on the Big IP platform. I'm monkeying around in DNS creating C names and aliases for our new load balancing implementation. One of my buddies, who I'll call Clueless from here on out, is over my shoulder double checking my work. As I said, very large organization. Me. Hey Clueless. I'm going to edit this record and remove this one. Are we good? Clueless. Looks perfect to me. Me. Brain farting. Perfect. I'll push the update. Can you clear your DNS cache and do a lookup? He pushes update. 
So please remember, I'm an ops guy. I do DNS work for breakfast and eat lunch while owning the big IP. Me. We good, Clueless? Um, the C name is good, but the A record doesn't resolve. Me. Last man to crap pants standing up since Cluster. What? Clueless. Yeah, the main site isn't resolving. So the main site is a portal for our entire medical system. It receives hundreds of millions of hits per day. Me. Craps pants again. F. Clueless. What happened? So thank God for DNS expiration. As it turns out, and what was a brain fart on my part, I marked an A record for deletion instead of a change. Clueless didn't see it either. In fairness, not Clueless's fault. He didn't do this every day. He's just clueless because he's a friend and was meant to double check my actions. And if dumb stuff happens, he does it 99% of the time. So thank the stars for logs. In about the span of 30 seconds, I take a look and see that I deleted something I shouldn't. Wouldn't you know it? I have a recycle bin and I'm able to undo the DNS delete. I restore the record. If I recall correctly, our external records were timed to expire every 15 minutes. So in that one to two minute interval, if a major ISP had not cached our record, unlikely, we might have been bunked, but otherwise in the clear. I looked at Clueless and basically said, we're going to sit here for 15 minutes. I'll monitor the VIP for traffic and monitor DNS for hits on the site. Have the phone ready to call a major incident. I might not have a job tomorrow. A full 30 minutes later, not one call, text, smoke signal, or carrier pigeon. Thank God for DNS time expirations. It's kind of good that you guys were there to check on each other and you knew exactly what to look for and how to fix it, so that was good. Your software is corrupting my computer. Background. In the 90s, I worked as a computer programmer at a small, roughly 30 employees, software company that wrote code for back offices, mainly for owner-operators of fast food franchises. When things got backed up or particularly confusing cases come in, we got tasked with support. The latter situation is this story. I wasn't the actual programmer involved. I'll call him Steve. However, I'll also note that while customer was wrong, <gasps> he wasn't a jerk. The story. Customer calls in complaining that after installing our latest software update, his hard drive is corrupted. Post hoc ergo propter hoc. Customer service rep says it's very, very unlikely our software is to blame. However, this is a very important customer and his computer is now basically unusable. So we agree to look at it if he delivers it to us. A few days later, we get the PC and Steve takes a look at it. Sure enough, hard drive is quite corrupted, and there's nothing installed on it but Windows 95 and our software. Steve reformats the hard drive, reinstalls Windows and our software, and we send it back to the customer. Everything works fine for a couple months, then BAM! Hard drive corrupted again. Customer's still convinced we're at fault, so we repeat the process with the same results. The exact same results. Everything works fine for a couple months, then BAM! Hard drive corrupted again. Well, this time around, Steve has a different idea. Customer's a couple hours away, but he's important. So Steve drives down to his back office to take a look. What does Steve find? There's a major copy machine with magnets inside of it, resting on top of the computer. <laughs> Steve reformats, etc., then asks him to move the PC. Problem permanently solved this time. The magnets were close enough to do damage, but far enough away and are weak enough to do the damage slowly. Yeah, I'm not sure I would have spotted that one either. I mean, I know better nowadays, but a long time ago, I probably wouldn't have thought twice about it. Security camera displays in HP Smart? Background. We're a managed services organization that takes care of our clients' IT needs by providing and implementing solutions for them. We have a client that has security cameras and they use HP copiers. Story. I got a call saying that one of the users weren't able to print and send photos of HP Smart giving errors. I remoted into OP machine and started off with a simple print test page, and it went through. I tested through Chrome with an online test PDF page, and that went through. I tried it through Edge, which is what OP was using, and that worked as well. It didn't make sense because I was able to do this both from Edge, Chrome, Adobe, and even download a local PDF document and still sent right on through. I went ahead and looked in HP Smart to see if there was anything noticeable there which it was giving us an error notice the whole time. I went into settings and advanced settings to see what might be in there and to my surprise a security camera popped up. On HP Smart? I was even able to sign in with zero issues, lol. I thought it was an IP issue which I checked both the camera and the copier and both were two completely different IPs. 
If anyone doesn't know, with HP Smart, when you click advanced settings, it generally takes you to the web page for that said device inside the HP Smart app. Somehow that copier either was at that IP of the camera, then was moved, and now thinks the IP is still the same. Not entirely sure. I ended up telling OP that if you use HP Smart, you'll most likely have issues, but if you print as you normally do, you should be okay. Of course, if they run into problems again, we'll take care of them, but I didn't see the need in fixing something that had zero issues while on the phone. I'm not entirely sure as to why this happened, so any ideas would be fun. Also, who hates HP Smart? Yep, don't know anything about HP Smart. It does seem kind of odd though that the uh, security cameras would end up in another software's uh, settings. Hey guys, thanks for hanging out with me today. If you've enjoyed this content, would you do me a favor? Would you consider giving this video a like, subscribe to the channel, and maybe click that little bell icon so you don't miss the fat guy with the beard telling you stories. See ya!